Yep, just came back up for me on Twitch anyway. Okay, we're going to have to reset the timer on this. But let me, I, I don't see it on mine yet, but that's irrelevant. Um, okay, I am seeing it on Restream. So I'm sorry about that. Okay. Uh, are Simon. Going, are we uh, good again? Yeah, I think I think we're yeah we're live again. Back on YouTube. All right. Well, as, as I was saying, um, uh, one game um, is a dragon port of uh, Mr. Do, which is called Mr. Dig on the Dragon, or was in the UK anyway. I don't know whether it was available in North America or not. Yeah, it was the and same I, same name. Yeah, and uh, I had I did a run on that. In fact, I didn't record the score or anything. This was recently. Um, Two and a half hours, a single good run. So I can do that quite quickly. Part of me thinks, you know, games got to be challenging, but at the same time, you know, if you're, if you're really quite good with yourself. Uh, Lunar Rover Patrol is another one of my favourites. Uh, yeah, there's loads of them. Loads of them, really. And, uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, I remember when I, uh, just before I got the Commodore 64, which was in about 1991, I hadn't used my computer for ages. It had been put away in the loft or something. I remember digging the old dragon out, blowing the dust out of it. I'd, I'd lost or broken any joysticks I had at the time, but I dug a few tapes out that still worked. And so I was playing the dragon all the way up until 1991, 92. So uh, there was a small gap there. But yeah, I, I wished I got into a programming a little bit side, side of it a little bit more. But other than that, you know, that's pretty much what I do. I play games. I sometimes stream games, and Dragon is a big part of that. And I don't really know if I have much else to say, to be honest. No, that's fine. Maybe we can go ahead and open it up to questions too. But I, I just out of curiosity because I have also been doing uh, posting of retro game videos and streaming of games. What has been your uh, viewership? Like, how many people will would you, on average, would watch you play a Dragon game live? <sighs> my viewership is not very good. Period on my streams, to be honest. Um, but because uh, I. I just stream what I stream. I don't really make it up much of an effort to promote it. Uh, my viewership for Dragon Games is probably about uh, ten to twelve on average. And that's a, that's think. actually good. You know what I what I do like about live streaming is if you have a chat audience, because sometimes you know, be careful what you ask for. If you got way too much chatter going on in the chat, you can't keep up with it. So I can't but, keep up with three or four people. And yeah. Yeah. And then, you, and then you, you know, but you build, you, you build, uh, you build a more intimate relationship with your audience that way too. Mm -hmm. Now I have a question for you, Simon. Um, do you almost always play like older dragon games? Have you done any experiment with some of the newer releases? Like some of the ones we've been talking about that, you know, Stuart and Karen and Steve have done. I haven't at the moment, but um, there is something that, that I might consider looking into because I'm always interested and I think it's wonderful that uh, people are still making games for these old machines like this, it's keeping it alive. So yes, it's, uh, it's something I, will consider, I would consider doing. I, don't, I haven't really done too much with it because it's mostly games that I'm familiar with for nostalgia's sake is what I've been playing. But I'm also, yeah, I could always expand my... Um, gaming library to the newer ones quite easily okay well we can get you hooked up with some of them here because there's some pretty yeah. good new stuff coming up too so what is your twitch channel we might as well plug that too it's so uh, cyber wgb just on twitch cyber simon, simon wgb simon w gb gb can somebody put that in the live chat it's like twitch.tv slash simon w gb like simon w great britain right is that what that yeah. gb stands for Pretty all right i had that as a email address originally when i lived in the united states so that's exactly what it stands for <laughs> right so we have we you know curtis scrapes the planet for news from all kinds of sources so he's always bringing us when people are doing dragon videos on youtube or twitch so we do try to plug you as we can and appreciate what you do for sure i must say uh, it's not exclusively Dragon stuff, so don't be surprised if you should find anything on me streaming anything. But I, when I do stream Dragon, that's where it will be. No, not a problem. And I'll try to remember to uh, add you as a follower on our Twitch page too. So to people who follow us, we can we can host you when you're live too. So because we're only live once a week, so be happy to do that to host you. Okay. Um, anybody have any other questions for for Simon? Our Dragon Twitch streamer. 
I have one other one. Do, do you have any plans or any thoughts of ever getting a real dragon to try playing with again, or are you pretty content? I'd assume you use x -Roy. Yeah, I do use x -Roy, yeah. Uh, you're going to find, probably find this a bit difficult to believe, but out of the three retro machines that I used to own, the dragon are probably the third priority that I would get as an actual machine because I just use it for games. But if I could get my hands on a Dragon 32, I would, I would, I don't know if I'd use it for streaming from, but it would be just something to have, wouldn't it? You know, it's, it'd be nice. It's a nice maybe, but I don't know. Yeah, I know you guys are getting the same problem. We are where prices are shooting up. So it's getting more and more yeah. difficult to pick up the old machines. I've been trying to look at, um, uh, Commodore 64s and kind of skyrocketing, so dragons probably are as well. <laughs> Dragon 64 would be the ultimate, but I know getting my hands on one of those would be like gold dust. <laughs> All right. Well, so thank we you, like Simon. Then, oh, did we have? Did we have another? Did we have another question? I'm sorry, did I miss something? No, I was just saying that Simon had better wait until I got my Dragon 64 or there'll be warfare on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we got we have three more presenters that we still have to get through. So we've got a good hour of a show left. So we're going to keep it moving. But thank you for being here. Um, and then uh, our next presenter, who I'm definitely looking forward to hearing from as well as with everyone, but Steve Bamford, a.k.a. Bosco, joins us. If you could uh, spotlight him for us, Mark B., Okay, I'll uh, I'll try and uh, rattle through my history and then focus just on a little <laughs> overview of my uh, current projects. I think that's probably the most interesting bit for everyone. Uh, so Apparently you play guitar. Oh, yeah, well, I try to play guitar. Um, so my first experience with a home computer was actually a Sinclair ZX81 that belonged to my brother, my older brother. Um, I, up until that point, I had literally no concept of a home computer. I just didn't know what he was talking about when he was saying he was going to get one of these things. My father worked for a large tobacco company uh, in their computer department. He loaded software onto the mainframes using punch cards and collected the output on like Z fold paper. Uh, that's what a computer was. Uh, so when my brother said he was getting a computer, I, I was just mystified. Uh, obviously, as soon as he, he set it up and uh, showed me how you plug it into a regular TV and you can type basic commands and I was hooked because as a, uh, a sort of creative child, someone who enjoyed like drawing, making comic books, um, making models and that. As soon as I realized you could take control of the TV screen and do stuff with that, I was just immediately hooked. So uh, the first family computer was the Dragon. So that was the one that I was able to uh, get to know. The, the, the Sinclair was strictly my brother's. So he'd let me on it occasionally. But the Dragon was the one where I learned about uh, computers. And I would be uh, 12 years old, I guess at that point. Uh, so then my brother, uh, in pretty short order, wrote two machine code games. He wrote uh, a jumping jack uh, Leggett clone called Ket Ketchup. And he wrote another one called Lights Out, which was, I guess, was like a game called Pub Crawl for the Dragon. Um, and when I saw him writing uh, assembly language games, I just wanted to do that because I realized that's how you needed the speed. You know, that's how you got the speed, sorry. Um, so my brother introduced me to machine code and he literally just sat me down. He showed me a basic program that poked every location of the screen with a value. And then uh, he showed me the exact same thing in machine code. And it was like a hundred times faster. And that little exposure to a, a game, you know, a loop, sorry, uh, poking values to the screen and that 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 pretty much explained most of what I I needed to know to get me started and then I just kind of learned on my own then um, I tried to write my own games uh, I remember trying to write a ghost and goblins <laughs> type platformer but as much as I understood uh, assembly language and uh, I was able to write little routines that I just couldn't get my head around the complexity of a, of a game. 
you know, how do you break that down into little manageable chunks? So uh, that was that. And uh, I just decided I'm not going to, obviously not going to be a programmer. It's, it's way, way too difficult. So that was that. That was the end of it. Um, fast forward to 2014. Um, a friend of mine, a work colleague, uh, told me he was uh, buying a Vectrex unit, an old one that re required repairing. And I said, well, what are you going to do with it? And he said, well, I'll write a game. And I said, what game? And he said, uh, well, just about every retro system has a Flappy Bird on it. So I'm going to write Flappy Bird, which he did. And we would talk about the 6809, and it kind of stirred up some of, the, uh, uh, some of that sort of forgotten knowledge, if you like. So I said, well, look, I'll, uh, I'll have a shot at it as well. I'll, I'll write Flappy Bird for the Dragon and Coco. It's a nice, simple game. It's, it's not particularly challenging, but, you know, it'll, it'll test me. Um, and at that time, I, didn't, I really didn't know that there was a Dragon community. Honestly, I just thought the Dragon was dead and buried, long gone. Uh, but I reached out to Kieran. Uh, via his website and I, I asked him you know uh, you know how to how would you go about it you know how, what, what assemblers are there and stuff like that and of course he had his own assembler but I don't think that was working with Windows at that time so he kind of very kindly pointed me at LW Asm and uh, that was that I, I wrote a, a Flappy Bird clone and it was really intended to be a, a random act it was just like yeah tick and then just go and do other things but by the end of it I was starting to get to know people in the community. I, I was aware of the community. I was getting to know people like Stu and Kieran and Rob and Perra and, you know, all, all sorts of people. And so the thought occurred to me, well, why not just carry on, just write something else? And uh, I was going to write something super simple again and just, just keep building up. And I think uh, uh, Curtis has commented before about looking at, other people's games over time getting gradually more complex using more interesting techniques. Uh, if I'd been smart, I would have done exactly that. I would have just wrote little games and got gradually more complex. But what I actually ended up doing was starting a simple game and then going, oh, you know, it would be better if uh, it was more like this. And, it, you know, I'd rewrite bits and it started, ended up being like one game rolling into another, rolling into another, rolling into another. And uh, th that's this is basically the game I'm going to just quickly give you an overview of now. So uh, in a minute, I'm going to screen share and just show you some pretty pictures uh, while I'm talking, just so that you kind of have an idea of what it is I'm talking about. Uh, so it's a re it's an original game. It wasn't original. Sorry. Originally, I was going to do a uh, another clone of something where someone had already worked out, you know, the design, but uh, I kind of got bored of that fairly quickly. So I wanted to do an original kind of character-based game. Um, and I've, I've always been uh, a fan of like uh, coin ops from companies like Taito, Konami, Data East, Nintendo, Sega, all those kind of Japanese companies where they've put out games with little quirky characters. Uh, always a huge fan of those, Rainbow Islands, all that kind of stuff. So I was kind of wanting to... Uh, do something in that vein. Um, the game that I'm developing, well, I'm going to, basically I call it Cersei's Island now, I'm pretty much going to stick with that, uh, runs uh, in a frame. And by that, I mean, it runs at 50 Hertz, PAL, 60 Hertz, NTSC, uh, as did uh, Flag and Bird, my Flappy Bird clone. Uh, it's currently uh, single buffered, unlike uh, Flag and Bird, which was double buffered. Uh, so it means that my rendering has to be really, really optimized just to keep ahead of the raster beam. Um, but it, originally it was just meant to be a uh, run on a stock Dragon 32. So I, I just wanted as much RAM as possible uh, free for uh, graphics and stuff like that. So I didn't want to use two buffers. Um, partway through development, I shared a video on YouTube when I, when I had my YouTube channel up and uh, John Linville saw it and he just kind of left me a nice comment, said it looked good. If I was ever interested in putting it onto a cartridge, he could help with that. And so uh, that made me think and I thought, well, you know, improved uh, music and sound effects, uh, but also um, that music and, and the sound effects wouldn't sound incongruous to the dragon, if that makes sense. It, it sounds like what the dragon could do if all you gave it to do was make those sounds. Uh, 
but because you're running a game at the same time, it kind of gets harder. But so the sounds that the uh, GMC can produce don't sound incongruous. Um, and um, obviously you've got the additional storage of banked ROMs. So I, I could make a, a much more interesting game, um, but it was still run on, my, on, a, on a stock Dragon 32, which uh, appealed to me. And I suppose uh, the, uh, the final piece of the jigsaw was Kieran uh, very kindly uh, added GMC support to XRAW. So it meant that I didn't even have to purchase uh, a cartridge at that point. I could just actually sit down and see whether I'm capable of making, uh, taking advantage of this thing or whether it's just going to be too difficult. So I was able to spend about a year developing for the GMC, just purely in XRAW. Um, and then lastly, I just like the idea of physical cartridge release. I just thought that was totally cool. So that really made me pivot towards making it uh, run on the GMC. Um, I'm going to try and uh, screen share now if I can. Uh, okay, do you guys see like Photoshop with a uh, screenshot yes. in it? Yes, yeah. see it. See it. Okay, yeah. it's just it's just going to make life a little bit easier. So, so I'm basically just going to rattle through what the game is about because when people see my videos, they must be going, "What you know? What the hell is this? You know, it's not really <laughs> like any game that." Uh, you can compare it to so it's, it's it's probably really confusing so i'm going to go through it really really quickly so the primary objective is is simple you've just got to collect treasure in order to progress through eight themed stages uh before finally battling uh, the sorceress cersei um and then once you've beaten cersei uh the game wraps as all the uh coinots did and it starts over but the difficulty ratchets up so yeah, you, you play through eight, eight stages, eight theme stages, and then the final boss fight, and then it goes up again, but you carry on racking up your score. It's all about high scores. Um, so the way you do this is you've got uh, stars. Now they probably don't even look like stars to you guys, but they look like stars to me. But these, can you actually see my pointer? Just out of curiosity. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna try and use it to draw your eye to certain things. So the, these, these elements here are like little, cute stars if you like with little rounded points on and uh, the idea is uh, they're, they're different types so it gives you a bit of a heads up on if i if i catch this star by jumping up and sort of punching it uh, it'll drop a certain kind of pickup so for instance this, this 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 is supposed to be gold right so if you if you hit a gold star the likelihood is it's going to drop you a nice piece of treasure or something um and then all the other stars you'll learn them and you'll know uh, which ones are going to pay out what kind of pickups. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so you basically jump. Uh, when the stars uh, detect the player is close by, they change direction. So they, 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 they kind of meander up and down under like, almost like a sine wave. But if you're like camping, if you're just waiting for them to come into uh, your, the little space above your head, to, they will detect that and they will change direction. So you can't just stand still and and just keep jumping up and getting them. They'll they'll try and evade you. So you've got to uh, kind of like jump around and and sort of come at them from angles and things like that. Um, the exception is is the skull star, which is basically if you touch that, you lose health, uh, and it'll also drop something uh, a pickup, which if you touch that you will uh, regret it as well so whereas the the good stars kind of try and keep out your way the the skull star if it's if it knows you're underneath it'll kind of carry on descending or if it's going up it'll change to descending so that that's basically the star so you spend most of your time uh trying to sort of pop these stars drop pickups collect pickups and fill your gold meter which is this thing at the top and when that meter reaches uh, full you've cleared the stage um, so that's the basic mechanic there. So uh, uh, I've talked about treasure, so I don't need to go over that again. Um, I'll just mention uh, coins. So some of that treasure will involve little spinning coins. Now, the basic gold coin uh, is just worth like 50 points or one noggin of gold. So they're quite common. They crop up a lot. Uh, there's then the, uh, what I'm calling a doubloon, which is exactly the same as the gold coin. But uh, every time you collect it, it doubles in value. So it goes from 50 to 100 to 200 and so on. Uh, so 
you kind of mentally have to keep track if you want to score big uh, when you're trying to prioritize what to go for at any one time because it's kind of a twitch game. Uh, if you know a doubloon's about to pay out 800, you're going to go for that. Uh, and then there's also a star coin, which uh, triggers a little sort of slot machine mechanic. Uh, if you've ever seen a game, a coin up called Diet Go Go, there's like these coins. And when you collect them, it's like three spinning, uh, I don't know, like fruit machine reels. And when they stop, if it's like a winnings thing, they, that cascades stuff down. Um, so then uh, I'll draw your attention to this bit at the bottom. So this is a sort of a cross between like health and, and a timer. If you've ever played um, Wonder Boy by Sega, uh, you'll know exactly what it's about. It's, it's basically a depleting health bar and you have to keep topping it up. If it reaches zero, uh, your character gets woozy and he topples into the water and you lose a life. Um, so it's vital that you keep uh, the, uh, that bar topped up by collecting uh, food, different types of food and drink. Um, I think in uh, Wonder Boy, they call it vitality. Uh, I've, 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 I've juggled between calling it time, uh, bonus, all sorts of things. I am settled on one, but essentially you've got these competing strategies of trying to fill your gold meter, but also trying to keep one eye on the on the health and keeping that filled up um some of the uh the pickups uh, that you get will act as um like time limited buffs like power-ups essentially so off the top of my head you'll have like actually this this one in the top corner so when you when you uh when you pick a power up up it, it, it occupies this little frame in the corner and uh so this one's like an amulet so where you've got the amulet you're invincible for a very short amount of time. And at the end of that time, it, it sort of pops off and there's like a little audio cue to tell you that that's happened. Um, there's also a chalice which uh, freezes your meter down here. So it stops your food, your, your, your energy going down momentarily, it freezes it. So it allows you to build it up, but it won't deplete. Uh, there's a, like a feather that makes you jump higher. So when the stars are normally out of reach, when the, the highest point in there, uh, sine wave you can jump actually a little bit higher with a feather and, and get all the stars uh, there's a lucky cat uh, so whenever the game is making like a, a coin flip to decide a random event uh, behind the scenes if you've got the lucky cat it'll always come down in your favor so you've got this kind of fantastic look with any random events and it goes on and on and on and on uh, probably the only one the only other one i'll mention now is uh, the wand so um, the wand can be used for lots of things. If you've got the wand, you can um, transform this character, which I'll, I'll come to a bit later on, but you can also uh, use it to open chests. You can, you can basically do little spells that, that achieve um, useful end, end uh, results. Uh, and then I'm, I mentioned um, nerfs. So if you collect, if you, sorry, if you collide with these skull stars, so you really need to just basically annoy, uh, avoid them. Um, you'll get a time limited nerf. So it could be a toadstool, which makes your health go down at twice the normal speed, or it could be a ship's anchor, which makes you jump half your normal height, uh, stuff like that. But again, they're time limited, so they wear off pretty damn quick. Um, I'll just, I'm gonna mention keys next. So down here at the bottom is a, like a little counter with some, um, a, like a, a key symbol next to it. So originally keys were like, pickups and they would appear in this top left hand corner and um when this character is like a little owl flies across every once in a while a bit like a mothership every once in a while it flies across the top of the screen and it drops something randomly on the screen sometimes it would drop a uh, treasure chest and you couldn't open the treasure chest without having a key when those two things aligned it felt fantastic you think oh yeah and of course because you have to work that little bit harder to get what's inside the chest you always got a better reward so the pickups are on a, like a sliding scale of common stuff that's not worth much to really rare stuff that's worth worth a lot so the better stuff would be locked in chests and other places so i like the fact that the uh, the reward of unlocking a chest was felt really nice but it was so hard to make sure you had a key at the same moment as a chest appears so i made a decision to make keys bankable 
So every time you collect a key, this number goes up. You can bank up to nine keys, but then whenever something that requires unlocking appears, you can spend keys on it. So a normal chest, it would cost one key to open. Uh, a rare chest would cost two keys. And I might even do an even rarer one that takes three or four keys or something like that. But you can guarantee whatever's inside the chest is going to be awesome. Uh, so that's keys. And then the other thing in the corner here is uh, gems. In a nutshell, collect 10 gems, you've got an extra life. So that's what that's about. So you just keep your eye out for gems. Um, now, I've just realized I should have probably changed to this picture here. So this is uh, another Photoshop image where I've sort of detailed a lot of the pickups and uh, various bits and bobs. So like this section of the screen here is the, is the health giving food stuff. So by collecting this, um, you can keep your vitality meter up. This is like treasure here. Here's your gems. Uh, and then this is just like uh, other pickups, which I won't go into now. Here's some stars, uh, various bits and bobs, little treasure chests. And then over here, I've got some other graphics. So I meant to show you that a little bit earlier, but never mind. Um, the every once in a while, when you're expecting the game to sort of generate a pickup, you will uh, occasionally get a little kind of crab who appears with his little pins, his little claws snipping away, and uh, you've got to kind of react to that. So. Basically, instead of uh, like generating a coin, let's say a, a crab might jump out and he'll hit the ground. And if you're to one side of him, he'll head he'll head that way. And if you're the other side, he'll head that way. So a good technique with a crab is just to let him hit the ground and then jump over him. He he'll just carry on going the way he first decides. So that's a little kind of little uh, random uh, event that happens every once in a while. Um, let me just go back to this first one. So. This, I, I don't know if you guys know your classics, you know, uh, Homer's um, uh, Odyssey, the epic poem, but basically in that Odysseus uh, travels to this island where Circe uh, lives and he's, all his crew go, go um, onto the land and they start eating all this food and Circe turns them into pigs. And my game was always going to have a sorcerer or sorceress in it at the end. And I had no idea other than that, that it was going to be something like that. And then it suddenly popped into my head. Why don't you make it Circe? Make all your crew have basically be transformed into pigs. Um, in the uh, intermission at the beginning of the game, you kind of see that happening. So you don't have to guess that. It can't, you, you should see it happening. And so you've got this little kind of pig mechanic, which uh, I'm quite proud of. So he basically trots around. He kind of patrols. And then um, if he gets to a, uh, like if this bridge wasn't here, he would get to the edge. He would stop and then he'll turn around and go back the other way. And he'll just keep going backwards and forwards like that. Um, if any pickups land in front of him or he, he basically comes up to them and touches them, he will eat them. So it's a kind of a, a double edged sword because you might need one more gem to unlock an extra life. And you might really, 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 really need that extra life. And it just lands in front of the pig and the pig just swallows it. But you have hey, a kind of a, a second uh, chance. Steve, I just want to interrupt real quick because we've gone way over the time because this oh, is really? good stuff. And I, I, I wanted to keep going, but I also wanted to be considerate to no, Stuart, Stuart and Tim who are following. So Stuart and Tim, are you guys okay if he goes on a little bit more or do you want to kind of get going well, I can well. wrap it up in about. Uh, no, get him off immediately! Like. Off, get him <laughs> off! Immediately. No, because we 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 are already at twenty one minutes into the fifteen minute block, but this oh, was good. I'm this sorry. was good stuff, and, and that's okay. But I, as much as I think everybody's interested, I just wanted to be fair to our two remaining presenters. Are you you guys okay with him? This well, look, look, why, why don't I just more? say this? If, if you're this interested great. in the project and you want to find out more about it, just look on Discord, and I just keep putting no, updates. Well, no, on but there. If, if if you guys are good, we'll let you keep going. I just wanted to in, interrupt briefly to make sure that they were okay with that. Because uh, Stuart, you okay? Stuart's giving us a thumbs up because I, I saw Tim looking like he was starting to have the pints were starting to catch up on him there. So I didn't want him to, uh, I didn't want him to, we didn't want to lose him before. <laughs> All right. So that's good. So this, the, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, just, okay, I'll, just I'll, knowing I'll, that, just bring us to, uh, I'll, I'll speed it. I'll speed it up. And yeah. 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 Last, yeah. Last and and, and, no, and trust me, I love this and I love cartridges and I love the sound chip and all this stuff. So I'm, I'm eating this up. So thanks. Okay. So uh, I think we've covered the pig mechanic. 
Uh, you've got enemies. So in this case, it's like a bee who goes in a kind of a, a circle, continuous circle as he moves across the screen. So you, you're going to have a whole host of different enemies that have, have different movement patterns. You learn the movement patterns. So you've got these, you've got all these things happening at once. You know, you've got your health to keep going. You've got your stars to catch. You've got your enemies. So it's all about juggling that, those priorities. Um, and then you've got the bird who comes across and drops what I used to call originally traps because he used to drop bombs and things like that. So you've kind of pretty much got to drop what you're doing when he appears. Uh, but then I started adding chests and pots and God knows. So every so often he flies across, drops something. You may or may not have to drop what you're doing and just deal with that. So it just adds to the, uh, the kind of pressure, if you like. And then I'm just going to really quickly uh, change to this screen. So this just gives you an idea of uh, like themed levels. So it's kind of the ga same game play. Each stage is the same gameplay, but I'm introducing like a theme. The idea being with the, the Games Master cartridges that I can have different music for each theme. Uh, so yeah, for each stage. Uh, it's kind of, I can have different enemies and a few different pickups and things like that. So hopefully when you play the final game, you'll get you'll be treated to lots of atmospheric music. So the uh, the swamp, the graveyard swamp thing will be spooky and, you know, whatever else. Uh, I, I'm not going to say any more than that. Honestly, if, if, if you're at all interested, just look on Discord. I'm going to try and keep regular updates on that. So uh, I'll stop sharing now. Uh, no, that's, 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 it's an amazing project. I know a lot of us are looking forward to this. And as Mikey Furman had mentioned in v, uh, VCF West, which was in California back in 2019, they had showed off a playable demo of this with the sound chip. And there right. were young kids on there and loving it. And people from different ages saw it and heard it and they were just blown away. So I, I think I speak for a lot of people when we say we are, we are anxiously awaiting this <laughs> and and I, I have tried to collect every cartridge that's been made for modern games from modern developers just because I like to collect them and I like to support the um, the developers. So I'm, I'm totally looking forward to this and I thank you for doing it. Yeah, thank you. Cool. So just, just for the brevity part of this to move things forward, we're going to keep going and then we have two more presenters and then we can circle back with more questions and answers. So um, up next, Mark Bosley, if you don't mind spotlighting Stuart Orchard. Uh, is that the stew? Stew, yep. yes. And even though I'm hungry, that's not like the stew we have for supper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here, Stuart Orchard. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Is anyone else getting saddle sore? <laughs> <laughs> I think the alcohol's worn off as well. So this can be, I'll, I'll keep this short and sour. <laughs> so, um, I've owned dragons since I was 12 years old. It was uh, a Christmas present after I'd nagged my parents for weeks and weeks and weeks because my best friend at the time had a dragon as well. And I was, like other people have spoken before me, um, completely fascinated by this machine, so from the word go. Um, and having this machine, it was... I, I then had a disastrous year at school where I didn't do any homework because I was spending every evening on this machine, just typing programs in out of the programming manual, out of the Dragon User magazine. I think I think my parents had quite a shock at the parent-teacher meeting where they, they said I was just basically, he's just lazy, he won't do any homework. So I had the computer taken off of me for a little while until I sort of learned how to do homework again. But uh, yeah, I, to grow up with a machine like that has quite an effect on a, on a young mind, especially as you sort of go through your teens. I think and that's probably the main reason I'm, I'm still fond of the machine now is because I grew up with the thing. And, and I have collected other computers over the years. I mean, I've got an Amiga in the loft, Tori ST, PCs, um, some other weird and wonderful bits of kit, but I'm, I'm not particularly interested in those. It's, I always come back to the Dragon. Uh, I suppose I should mention how I got into programming games. I, I had a dragon for many years, and then um, a friend of mine gave me the All Dream Assembler on cassette. So that's when I started learning how to program in machine code. And others have mentioned when you first start seeing how fast machine code runs, it just, it just blows you away if you're used to writing programs in BASIC 
the equivalence in machine code is just insanely fast. You know, it's hard to comprehend how something could actually work that fast. You know, how does the machine keep track of what it's doing? Well, well, getting all confused at that speed. You know, it's, it's, it's a strange thing. But I, I quickly got into that and I thought, I could write a game now. I could actually write a game. So that's how Bulldozer started. I just, a friend of mine with a C64 had Arkanoid and I thought I'd love to see something like that on the Dragon. So Bulldozer actually represents my first attempt at a decent machine code game. And I was probably 15 years old at the time, 16, something like that. And I didn't actually plan to release the game, but uh, some uh, friend of a friend sort of mentioned that they were publishing games and would I be interested in sort of submitting mine for publishing? So I said, yeah, please. So to me, that's just free money. Um, you would have done it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, if you ma imagine writing a program for the fun of it you don't really value your time the way you should so so sort of having this game sold it was just like free pocket money to me uh, i had quite a good experience of that that sort of got a favorable review so that encouraged me to write uh, a second game which was uh, the the uh, road tab that uh, I'll, pro I'll probably save a lot of the story for next week just just to save time uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun writing Road Tab. Uh, to, unfortunately, around that time, the, the Dragon market was sort of imploding. So, um, Dragon User, which was sort of propping everything up, that 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 folded because um, of dwindling subscriber base. Um, lots of software houses were sort of giving up and disappearing and going on to more profitable platforms. So my games in the end didn't really do that well. So I was probably part way into writing a third game when I, I just thought this isn't worth it anymore because nobody's going to buy this game. And I sort of drifted away. And I sort of went to university, came back. Um, I can't remember why, but I sort of drifted in and out of the hobby sort of over the years. I sort of kept coming back to the dragon, leaving it, coming, it, coming back again. Um, eventually I sort of uh, found uh, the World of Dragon sort of uh, archive site and there were still people talking about this thing um, so that's sort of how I got back into the Dragon again sort of the last few years and always wanted to do a better job of Road Tab so that's what this uh, Return of the Beast demo is about it's just sort of my attempt to do it the way it should have been done Yeah, we took a look at that uh, Return of the Beast there, and uh, that that's impressive. I mean, just the sound when we first ran it, we were ran on the Mega Marathon there, um, and it, it just blew me away. Like that, that was like Coco Three level sound coming out there, and then the super smooth scrolling and tons of sound effects going off in the background, and everything running you know nice and smooth. Like normally, I'm used to seeing like the old stuff that tries to attempt that. It's like jerky, you know, a bit of extra sound, so everything slows down and. And I think you'd mentioned in your blog, and that's another real excellent resource you did too. You did a blog kind of covering your development of all your games and, and Return of the Beast in particular, and what you'd learned from originally doing Bulldozer and Road Tab, etc. In fact, your your third un, unreleased game actually looked really cool too, that you actually have a couple of little, little video clips in your blog about. Oh, the Black Planet game. Yeah. 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 It's a shame I abandoned that because that's sort of half done. I mean, it had lots of problems with it, but yeah, I think that could have been sort of turned into a game if I'd sort of spent more time on it. Yeah, because you had so, parallax scrolling and stuff in there and all kinds of fancy stuff, if I remember. Yeah, it's sort of crazy things, sort of two levels of background. So but all of that sort of slows the game right down. You sort of, you have to be careful with the, the the technical feats. You still have to have a playable game sort of yeah. after all of that. So that's that's the danger. There's a danger of losing sight of having a playable game. Uh, yeah, and Return of the Beast, I mean, all of that sort of technical achievement, it comes at a cost. It's taken me years to do that. It's just exhausting, you know, to get the scrolling working, to get the sound working right, you know, to get 
if the sprite's optimized enough to get keep the frame rate of the game high enough to make a playable game. So I, w- I will finish it. Just uh, I, I find these days, you know, I go through phases where I have lots of enthusiasm, then I'll just burn myself out and I have to take a step back and just watch um, clips of cats on YouTube for a while. <laughs> so <laughs> get my energy back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, to be honest, I did the same thing with Nitrous 9 because, I mean, we went hellbent for leather on it from 92 to 2001, and then I didn't touch it for 12, 13 years afterwards because I had burned myself out on it. Well, that's it. You can, you can put you can actually find energy to keep going for years, but it, it catches up for you in the end and you have to take a break from it. Otherwise you'll, you'll end up hating it. That's the problem. So, you know, I, I like to enjoy the hobby. So I sort of take a step back now yeah. and, again and just and enjoy what other people are doing. You know, you take time to appreciate what other people are doing. And also inspires you too. And you can see that they've accomplished something that they wanted to try. And they kind of goes, yeah, I guess I can get back and do my, my thing too. I, yeah. I did want to ask you specifically, like I know your, your blog really mentions like you're hitting technical limitations of the speed of the machine, et cetera. And there's a couple of ways to possibly get around. Like I know on the Coco side, some people have purposely made a game cartridge only because then they can kick in that double speed poke. And because you're running the code from ROM, all of a sudden you get a 30%, 50% speed increase. RAM is still sorted. I don't know if you'd thought of maybe doing that for something to try to get around some of these limitations or limitations. And the second one, of course, is the one I always push on everybody uh, is a six through a nine. Cause of course you have the TFM instruction for block copying memory that's interruptible. So you can even like, you know, do, you know, these syncs or even H syncs if you want to try to time a sound routine or something. So I, I was wondering if you have ever thought of that to make it a bit easier on yourself so that you're not ramming your head against the wall so much. Well, uh... Yeah, the speed up poke, that's like the, the ace up the sleeve or get out of jail card if um, if there isn't enough time to do everything you need to do in two video frames. But so one of the good things about coding for the Dragon is you've got quite a few more machine cycles per frame to, to fit a game in. You can, you can get more work done per video frame on a Dragon versus a Coco. So... A speed up poke may be one way of making the Coco version viable. So I will literally use up every single cycle of the frame for the PAL version. So to make that work on the Coco, it almost have to be a different game. Something would have to give, I'd have to have fewer sprites or something like that, or use a speed up poke. And the, the two different frame rates on the two platforms will give you two sort of slightly different difficulty levels. So the Coco version would have to be tuned for that rate. So it, I think it'd have a slightly different look and feel to a Dragon version when I finally get around to it, that is. Yeah, because I, I know you mentioned the blog, like the Return of the Beast, that you had originally, when you first released it for people to try, you said it's basically Dragon only because of the 50 versus 60 hertz. And then you said, oh, update, I did get it working on, on the Coco on, at 60 hertz, but that's not the full game. Like you've mentioned to me that you're actually planning on a 64K version with a whole bunch of extra stuff in it eventually yeah, for the final game. So, Yeah, you, you may even find with even with the existing demo that's out there or running on a Coco, it would probably drop frames now and again when there's a lot happening on the screen. I mean, it's it's been tuned for 50 hertz, so it shouldn't ever drop a frame, but it certainly will drop frames at 60 hertz but that's just a case of just balancing the workload and sort of changing how much it tries to do per frame sort of depending what pl- platform we're running on and the cartridge version yes that that would allow us to go that little bit quicker so yeah yeah your other option i mentioned before the six or nine even if you don't change the rest of the code you could just kick it in native mode and that gives you about 10 to 15 percent speed increase with the exact same instructions that might be enough to push you over to yeah, yeah, that's another option. Although, I mean, I do have a couple of 6309s and I've resisted the temptation so far. I know <laughs> I know. once I get into it, I'll, I'll just I'll lose a year just playing 6309s. That's, that's the way it goes. I'd, yeah, I mean, it, it took us 20 years to convince Nick Morentes to finally write a 6309 game, but he, he's, he's well on board now. So, Well, I mean, we'll go into more detail in your games because I want to save, you know, some of the questions and some of the comments stuff when we do the full interview and kind of go through your entire catalog, go through your blog a bit and stuff too. And so. I think you said it, but didn't officially say it, but you are our feature interview next week. So we're going to have a longer, more in-depth interview with Stuart Orchard next oh, week cool. on the show. 
Cool. I'll watch that as well. It sounds good. Yeah, yeah. You should you should check it out. He's <laughs> he's, he's a brilliant bloke. <laughs> Anyway, definitely thank, thanks for the games you have done, the commercial ones you did back in the late 80s there. And then uh, Return of the Beast is actually, uh, to me, it's a showcase game for the dragon. I mean, the sound routines and, and the smooth scrolling stuff you've got going on there. That's one of the most impressive Coco 1, 2 slash Dragon 3264 games I've seen. Yeah, it's very kind of you to say so. And I did, Stevie, I don't remember seeing any real frame slowdowns when we were trying it. I do not remember seeing that. We were playing it on a Coco 3, but I wasn't running any speed up pokes or anything. But no, yeah, it played really smooth. We we showed it off on the Amigos uh, Marathon. So there were people from all around the world watching it, and they were all really impressed. And we did let the kind of Sid player on the title screen play for a bit because that, that introductory music is brilliant as well. Uh, but no, it plays really well. And one of the things, too, not only does it look well and play well and it's buttery smooth, but you did a great job kind of cycling through the four colors that are available to us on there. And a similar thing was done with a um, color computer cartridge that was called Polaris, which was kind of a, um, a clone of Missile Command, but it took the limited palette and just kept mixing them up to kind of replicate what it would be like if we had palette registers. And those are the things I used to like about playing games in the arcade, like Centipede and Missile Command, is that even though it was the same game, every time the screen changed, the colors changed, so it gave you the feeling of progress. And I think you pulled that off brilliantly with how you did that. There's, I mean, it's just this, this game is a tribute to what is possible on the machines that seem like they were limited. You just seem to have overcome all limits, you know, so bravo. Thank you. Actually, I did want to mention too, uh, I mean, getting into the, the limitations of having a four color palette and what you can do with it. I think both you and Steve Bamford, you know, the previous movie showing us some of the graphical designs for all the various characters and items in this game. You both have a really good eye for how to generate four color graphics that look, they look like more like you're using dithering and stuff. So you suddenly look like you have extra colors, especially if you look at it a little bit of a distance and it, it really enhances, enhances the uh, visual feel of, of both of your games. Steve takes it to the next level just just amazing what you can do with that crappy palette <laughs> well, what, what, what steve has done is amazing i basically I've, I've 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 tried to get the best out of those four colors and when people say oh you know we could change the palette if, if i change the palette i'd want to do them again but make it work with those colors to, for me it's not just a case oh yeah you could change the green to this and the, it would break all the little uh, relationships that I'm using between the colors to get the effects that I want. So uh, it is just a case of you, you stuck with these colors and so make, make the most of them and do what you can with them, I think. Cool. There's something very vintage and retro too about using like the P mode one low color mode where the pixels are basically as big as they're going to be. You know, that kind of low res look, I think sells the vintage vibe of the game too. Yeah, you, you can get a busy screen because it's like quite low res. You can get a busy screen uh, quite easily with only using like 3K. Uh, so there's all sorts of performance benefits as well. And of course, you've got nice square pixels, which are kind of nice to work with. So there's all kinds of benefits, I think. Yeah, and bo both of your games exemplify that very, very well. Cool. And, and in the same caliber of your two games, I did the same thing with Cosmic Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the same caliber, but yeah. Use the same mode, I'll give you that. Yeah, well, thank you, Stuart. I don't know if, any, if you guys have more questions or just want to uh, congratulate him on all he's done, but we're definitely going to have a longer version with Stuart next week, so look forward to that. Yeah, I do have more um, questions, but I am saving them for the interviews. So. Yeah, I'm going to save some for the interview. Um, any more questions? Are we ready for our final presenter of the program today? Going once, going twice. Or we'll save right. it for next week. Yeah, so uh, Mark Bosley, if you'd like to spotlight Tim Gilberts. If he hasn't passed out on us yet. Okay. Still with us, Tim? I am indeed, yes. <laughs> Welcome still... to Dragon Talk, Tim. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been, a, well, it's, it's, a, it's a real honor to be here because uh, I think uh, it's not, um, 
I, I do feel a, definitely a, a bit of an intruder into the dragon scene because uh, although I was a dragon user back in the day, um, we really, there was only one product ever produced by the publishing company from us. And uh, as we said in the lead up, uh, why would we, uh, why didn't we get there? So um, I know you like a bit of a background. I mean, people who know me would have seen this used a few times, but uh, I, I sort of got into electronics in the 1970s, but then um, we really switched to computing after I went to an after school club run by the maths and religious education teachers. Um, one of them had a TRS-80 uh, level one, a sort of Tandy link there for you vaguely. And, um, and the other one had a ZX-80, so which is the Sinclair sort of story. And um, we, we were using a language called Cecil, which is exactly what that is for the dragon, um, <clears throat> in, uh, in, in that class to learn, learn programming when we basically write it all out on punch card sheets. They'd be sent off to the county hall mainframe where someone had uh, stick them through an OCR, early OCR machine. And you, a week later, you get a printout and say you've made a syntax error. So um, one of the first things I did when we'd been learning basic, I think the teachers were about four pages ahead, but I was rushing off, typing up everything I could find in magazines, learning it. So it was really enthusiastic. So I was a bit asthmatic, so I found it easier than, than soldering. Um, did quite a bit of practicing with my dad's Sinclair Cambridge programmable calculator to learn how to, to code <laughs> anything I could get my hands on but um the maths teacher lent me a TRS-80 and uh, I sort of got into basic and started programming and uh, I wrote a Cecil interpreter for it so that we could use it in class to punch in our programs and run them straight away get the results on the TRS-80 and, and off we go so that's really how I, I got started into into the world of programming so I started saving up for ZX-80 because it would be the, the only one I could afford um <clears throat> definitely very uh, not well off um but by the time I'd managed to save enough, Sinclair had launched his ZX81, so I ordered the kit and built that. And um, it didn't work, so I had to send it back to Sinclair. On my fault, apparently, their Z80 was faulty. But they sent it back with a faulty resistor, so fair is fair. I had to fix that before I could use it. But um, I think I lasted about two days, worked out to get some invaders moving over the screen and realised I need the, the 16K RAM pack. For those who don't know the ZX81 only had 1K of memory, you really couldn't do a lot with it. Um, so of course then I wrote a version of Cecil for it. So um, as soon as Sinclair launched the Spectrum, I bought one of those, and um, we I persuaded Dad to fund it really and said, look, we you know I can write some software for this, we can make some money. Um, so that's pretty much where we got to, and then um, we sort of started writing these games through the summer of, of eighty two, um, and we placed a little advert in um, your computer, which is a magazine. It was due to come out in. It was the October issue. I don't know whether they do this in the US, but the magazines come out the month before they're dated. So the October issue would have come out in early September. So, um, of course, the Dragon was launched in August of 82. So, uh, you know, it was literally the, the month before um, we placed our first advert for, uh, for, for programs to be sold commercially as a company. Well, <laughs> me working for my bedroom selling games in a, in a plastic bag with a cassette tape and a manual. So... Um, <clears throat> Well, I think that was probably where we, we got the dragon fairly soon after we started doing those is um, probably we talked about boots earlier. I think it's what you Americans would call a drugstore, which would make it really unusual being having to buy a, uh, a computer from there. But we, we I think we bought an early 83 um, and um, we actually used it, not not initially for writing games. Um, we had, a, um, well, we've still got the leaflet actually, we bought a, a Sikosha printer from uh, micro peripherals, a GP100A impact printer, which we put onto the Dragon and we used it to print out all our um, instruction booklets and address labels. And uh, I don't know if I can share my screen a minute. If I, uh, so a little look, yeah, that one, hopefully. Um, yeah, I'm gonna look at my ugly mug now. Um, so uh, we, um, where was it? If we go, there we are, that was our little first little advert um, run, run out of my house. Um, still no Dragon software, but also for the 16K ZX81. And we then had um, a, uh, <clears throat> oh crumbs, sorry, I'm gonna need to drink in a minute. <laughs> so we, we looked at these sort of um, uh, things for what we could do with uh, the Dragon. And one of the things we, we did, like I said, we printed all the little labels and instructions that went in the, the, uh, the games. 
Um, I'm trying to find a copy of it, but we haven't got a, haven't got a picture yet. No, oh, that's a shame. So we, um, I loved the six, eight, or nine that was on the Dragon. It was, uh, you know, it was a great, it was a great uh, microprocessor. I'd already learned Z80 intensively, but it was so much more logical than the Z80. And by this sort of time, we'd, we'd uh, met a guy called Graham, who was um, writing adventure games. And uh, he'd given us a couple of games to sell, which was um, a game called Magic Castle. Very early, uh, <laughs> paper produced an early version of the, uh, the inlay for it. And he lent me the game adventure writing system he'd um, uh, done that was uh, based on a, an article from a magazine, Practical Computing, 1980. And that's um, the front cover is actually the Adventure 2 Interpreter by a guy called Ken Reed. And uh, that was in August, 1980. And uh, I used that to write a, uh, an adventure game called uh, Diamond Trail. Um, and it was it's basically just a way of stitching together an assembler interpreter because the, 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 the thing concept of writing an adventure game maybe we ought to get a bit distracted with what an adventure game is for the for all you arcade game players who probably don't play them that often but um the uh the system is designed that you can sort of insert like locations to go to visit and objects and and places put them together and then the actual interpreter runs the game for you a little bit like typing a basic program in and having the basic interpreter run it and it's a much easier way of writing games but it was still pretty a difficult way of doing it but um it was, you know, it, it got you the game running. We were, and I started working on a dragon version of the interpreter. Um, I think we were, um, oof. we were very close to actually releasing these games. Um, we'll see a bit how close later, but uh, I'll think of, uh, I think of one, one other picture I had here that I thought you might like to see from my early scans was, um, if I can find it, as the adventure game. For some reason, my machine is playing up can you see those yeah there we go then so we did actually get the labels printed for our games um and as you can see here it is cecil for the dragon which we've done a version of and also diamond trail um and there's uh, magic castle for the dragon 32 so we were definitely uh we were definitely planning on launching these games for the uh, the dragon but unfortunately um well we'll see so if you take adventures on the dragon of course it was there was a, there were a lot around i mean casa which is a really big archive of adventure games this 155 for the dragon which is quite a lot but you know our final product which was um, a program for writing adventures called quill for those who don't know me and haven't seen the t-shirt um there were around 800 games produced for that so uh you could count yourself lucky probably because you didn't get the quill therefore you didn't get an influx of 800 games um, some of which were maybe not as good as others, <laughs> but uh, us have been challenged with anyway. So um, the, the the difficulty, I think, is a lot of the games would obviously adventures are really easy to write in basic because it's got string handling. So those sort of companies um, who'd uh, been able to write games um, in basic, um, they had a, a way of sort of rapidly port into multiple machines, which is why there were a lot of still a lot of adventures able to be produced. And I think you'll find that the people who had done, um, like Scott Adams, who was a big entry into almost every processor, coming from the American market, had the cocoa there. You know, it was worth doing a 6809 interpreter. There was a market for it. And he, he managed to get there. If you look at all the UK companies, I mean, there was uh, quite a few from a company called Arctic. They based their game system on the, work, the same article in practical computing. Um, they never did a 6809 version of an interpreter. We didn't. It's quite a large cost of entry because you've got learning the new processor. Um, you know, it's the Dragon was a relatively new machine. And we didn't have Duncan's great book when we first looked at it. I mean, I, when I was trying to learn about the, the Dragon, um, I had to get, uh, I found this actually, but just as I was looking through it before the show, literally, I found the receipt from Tandy, <laughs> which is me buying uh, this sort of guide to the colour computer graphics because I, I knew that they were the same on the dragon and the dandy color so um and i bought this in when was it so this would have been july of 83 so uh you know this is my first chance to start learning about it and i did touch on a we've got a fairly big red book here that i managed to find in my attic when i went searching for all the records here and in here there are lots of little loving clippings from 
and notes from magazines and dragging computer. Yeah, I'm sorry, I actually cut up computer magazines and stitched them into folders in research. So, but it was still quite a bit of effort to really produce that. Um, so we had a, it, it would have been difficult. I mean, one thing that struck me early when people were talking about no lowercase on a dragon, um, there would be, uh, and it sort of ties in with was saying this as well about puzzle type games being popular on in, in, in the UK. I think that's true, European type games. And, and therefore the low, no lower case would favor those in the adventure terms, as well as in, in traditional um, uh, arcade games, would favor the sort of puzzle, treasure fetch style games, rather than long interactive fiction type games that Infocom would produce. You just can't do that without lower case. It's unpleasant to read and things like that. So uh, it's just something that struck me early when we, we were talking about that. So anyway, the reason you didn't get it is a very simple one. I was, um, I had all this technical data. I'd, uh, I, you know, good said he'd love the 6809, loved playing with it, bought myself a copy of Dasm and Demon to be able to have a cartridge assembler and debugger. Um, it was all ready set, you know, big printouts of my Z80, writing down equivalent 6809 on the paper, got bored of writing that out, thought I might as well just type it straight in. I can do this in my head, transcoding from Z80 to 68. Well, I typed it all into, you know, hit the save button. And I think the electricity, John Whitworth must have run it out in England because it didn't make it all the way to finishing the save command. And I probably lost a whole day of transcoding straight into it when I went to, didn't say, that's burned in my memory. And I, I definitely know why you need to make backups on a regular basis as a, as a, a, a programmer for the rest of my life. So uh, that's, that's really the big reveal pretty much because I, I sort of just got fed up of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I'm not typing all that in again. And, and all of a sudden, then the, the world sort of started getting busy with other pro weeks, sort of running a company became busy. And somehow I just never got around to doing that programming. And um, we, we sort of paired off into other directions. We, we produced the Quill. It, it became a runaway success. Um, by then, of course, um, you know, we, the, the dragon the financial difficulties were starting, that there was uh, rumblings. And I think maybe we saw, you know, bought a drag we started on the Commodore 64 conversion of products and and the dragon got away. So that's pretty much why you didn't end up with quill type games on the dragon, I think. And uh, I went, we obviously ran the company till the, the end of the late 80s. And I, I did a stint in Spain working with Aventura SAD doing Spanish language interpreters and the Dard Adventure System, um, which of course, you, you talked to Stefan a while ago. He's uh, he was a big fan of darts and produced a lot of games with it. Um, in order to produce for the Dragon, because there's no six eight or nine interpreter for Dard, um, he's had to switch to um, uh, Puny Inform to be able to produce his his uh, director's cut. Um, but that's why you're getting that. So uh, maybe we are we we still need to get that six eight or nine adventure interpreter running. Um, so you can finally get all those games written with Quill and Swan and Dard. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I want to do the same for the you know, some of the other projects I'm working on as well. But I think it was touched on earlier. You just you, you have a good spur to it. And I did. I did really put an effort into recovering the software off of the tapes. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Dragon was set up on my desk top for quite some time um, with uh, quite a few of the... Uh, if we look, hopefully I've got a, why is that not doing it? There we go, there we go, there we are. Genuinely, there's me recovering some bits of software from it, from the various cassette tapes and uh, starting to, to get it uh, running again. Um, and I've got the, I've got quite a bit of the assembly language code, um, which is uh, being pulled off of the tapes. So uh, hopefully at some time I can actually get it all running again. And uh, maybe we will get a, a working, uh, set of adventures for the uh, for the dragon but uh, I don't know <laughs> we'll see <laughs> um, I mean the retro world I mean I you know I've really been obsessive with it I think like everybody said you get back into it you suddenly discover I think someone bought me a bluetooth keyboard years ago that was uh, allowed me to use my spectrum again and I started rediscovering all the machines I had in the attic and bought loads that I didn't have back on eBay hence, hence why I ended up with so many dragons um, rediscovering it but then I sort of paused a minute and thought what would have happened if I'd been more interested in the 70s and so I've been doing quite a lot of rebuilding computers from the 1970s so 
Um, this is one we did during lockdown. This is a, a project. It was to uh, recreate a, a machine from 1976, 77 called the Scrumpy, which is a, um, a British sort of early microcomputer kit. Um, and uh, the, when, when we were off camera, when we had the break, I showed Duncan the, uh, the little board I'd uh, built that reads the Dragon keyboard that was allowing me to use uh, to build a Triton because I didn't have a keyboard to run it. So there's always millions of different retro projects you want to get involved in, isn't there? But uh, it keeps nagging at me, the Dragon. And every time we do something like this, I pull it all back out again and I do a little bit more. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping I'll get there. I really am because uh, I really do love the Dragon. It's a great machine. Um, you know, and it, it basically ran our company for it was our first business machine. You know, that, that's how we used it. It was a, it genuinely was. It had a really good keyboard and, you know, my mum could use it to type up labels and addresses for sending out tapes and things. It was used quite extensively. So uh, we'll see it one day, I'm sure. Well, that's about it, really. I mean, that's, that's the story of why you didn't end up with cool games on the Dragon. <laughs> yeah. Well, there were still some other games that were cool, but it would have been nice to see those. This is almost like the uh, AGD. Once this engine exists, there's an existing library can just magically appear yeah. on the platform, which would be amazing. Yeah. Um, and thanks for and thanks for being a trooper, especially Stuart and Tim for having to wait till the tail end, and, and Steve Vamper too, in the audience too. Uh, We're used been, to it in adventures. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're um, just trying to broadcast the show has been an adventure. So. Yes, it has. It's been, um, <laughs> we're going to have to look into an alternative uh, multi-streaming platform here soon. Uh, do we have any questions or comments or praise you guys want to give Tim? We got, you know, we got time to do that at this point now. And he's our last presenter. Um, and, I do uh, have one question uh, uh, on the, because I'm not familiar with the Quill in particular. Is that meant for cassette-based games or meant for disc games or does it handle both? It's absolutely mainly a cassette-based system for Quill. Um, we did a later one called Professional Adventure Writer that supported all the disk drives on the uh, on the spectrum. But the, obviously, on the Commodore 64, the Quill would support the disk drive anyway because it was a built-in feature of the the operating system. So you know, basically, it was it was easy to support on the there. But for other machines, it was it would have been it's it's really around things that fit in memory in one go the infocom model is all about pulling is very much like the original adventure where it's assuming it's got a disk drive that pulls the data off of the disk as it needs to whereas quill is very much about what fits in memory in one load um, a lot of the users were very clever and created a way to chain from one part to another so two and three part games were quite common with the object moving between them and that but they would there's no multi-loaders but yeah no it's very much cassette focused and i think that's the other side of it that's where scott adams's work on the games was designed for these smaller size machines by using this sort of puzzle thing taking the essence of adventure and, and squeezing them into a micro and, and, and ken reed's article was very much about how you get something that should be impossible really on a micro into a into a micro yeah, the reason I was asking, because you're you you're talking about, you know, having to do the transcoding and the porting and, you know, the, the difficulties of getting all that done. You have to worry about screen size and everything else. I thought that might be a good project to put as an OS9 because you have so many built-in things for printing and scrolling the screen and positioning the cursor. It's all built in. You don't have to do any of that coding. You just send it the scapegoat or control code sequences and you're done. Yeah. And it might make it oh, a lot yeah. easier for the port. Absolutely. And, and I think it, it really is. The, the only difficulty in the blockage for me was having to move to a 6809 because all the game interpreter has to be transcoded into 6809. I mean, it's it actually, once you've got it, I mean, once we had 6502 version of it, the Atari one, the Apple one, um, they all fell very rapidly. You know, if you have a ZD machine, it's, it's really rapid to port an adventure interpreter because you obviously it's written in the same way you've got like you say, an interface to the to the game engine that just abstracts it very much like the, the sort of BIOS does for the Dragon into the hardware, you know, um, for, for Microsoft, for MS Basic to run on it, you know, you have give it that abstraction there. So, yeah, it's only building that, but we had to do the whole lot, obviously, and that, that just, that's an extra processor, which is also why there isn't one for the Scrumpy, apart from the fact it's only got 256 bytes of memory as well. That <laughs> might be a bit of a yeah, because then you'll be all ready once the Coco Dragon version is done, you'll be all ready for the Vectrix. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that'll be your uh, crumbs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you've got to define the points. Um, text is going to be quite hard, yeah. isn't it? I mean, it's kind of quite a complex. A bunch of vector plots for all your letters yeah, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But you'll have lowercase. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could do lowercase in the dragon if you used the graphics mode, couldn't you? Yeah. So uh, you just wouldn't have a lot of memory left. So I know it's not. I think on the dragon actually came with that by default, unlike the, the North American level one. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's good. 
All right. Well, how about we do this? We don't necessarily have to end the show, but how about we run the outro and then we'll just circle back for uh, final thoughts and discussions and roundtable stuff. Um, and if you, so if you could, when you do that, Mark B, if you could share sounds and, and everybody, so everybody can hear this special outro that we've created for the show. Um, great show. I'm glad we're all here and I'm glad you guys all came together and hopefully we did, hopefully we did your computer and your community proud. Hopefully we did right by you guys. Cause that was our intent. Um, put on a quality show for this quality machine in this community at large here. On, Zoom. Uh, <laughs> Zoom doesn't want to behave. <laughs> this double click it. It should blow it up. Yeah. No? Well, it ain't, it ain't. It ain't oh going. man. So you, yeah. You it's just, good. we were just plagued with technical challenges, but this was uh, considering the size and scope of this show. The fact that we still managed to get through it was, uh, <laughs> It's a small testament to perseverance, right? Uh, and it's kind of funny, actually. I just got a private message from Sloopy. He was the guy who does our time indexing on our episodes. And he's going, why is there a part one and a part two and a part three? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to splice all these together. So you guys will get an email of, uh, of the solid show that you can share with people and yourselves and whatnot. All right, here we go. Here's the outro. This concludes the very first Dragon Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Dragon Computer. I'd like to extend a very special thank you to L. Curtis Boyle for all of the coordination required to assemble this panel. His efforts were tireless and directly resulted in the success of this special. We'd also like to thank our esteemed panel of Dragon users who joined us in person, in spirit, and virtually. So thanks go to Chris Poacher, Karen Anscombe, David Ladd, Duncan Smead, Henry Reitfeld, John Vella, John Whitworth, Nigel Barnes, Per Surratt, Richard Harding, Roberto Fernandez, Simon Waterfield, Steve Bamford, Stuart Orchard, Tim Gilberts, and Tormod Volden. Also a special thanks to our cast and crew who helped with this episode. D. Bruce Moore for being the Minister of Retro Computing. Nick Morota for his Game On segment. John, Aaron, and Brent from the Amigos Retro Gaming for sharing their insights. Mark Bosley and Grant Leedy for being available as backup streamers and engineers. Samuel Gimes for his ever-brilliant Coco Thoughts. Alan Murphy, Nick Morentes, Sloopy Malibu, and Mark Overholzer for behind-the-scenes work. And everyone who helps make this show rewarding for each of us each and every week. Dragon forever, people! All right, history has been made. The first ever Dragon Talk. We did it. Yay, we did it. We yeah, got... no thanks to Restream, which I take no yes. responsibility for. Oh. I think you should have a round of applause for our hosts at uh, Coco Talk, guys. That was amazing. Well done. Thank you, guys. Thanks. We wouldn't have had a show without all of you, though. So, I mean, yeah, thank you, Curtis. You're because... yourselves. The email, the email threads that were going on, it, I was a month behind on just catching up to the emails. And when I did, it was like it took a day to read all the threads and get caught up and everything. Hey, Steve, there was so much. Yeah, Grant. Yeah, I just got a, a email from YouTube. They've lost the recordings. We need to do this all over again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got, we got local recordings. Oh, Lord. Yeah. So I'm going to have to stitch this show together. Um <laughs> But yeah, we had over 24 people on the panel at any given time and a uh, great turnout on viewership. And uh, thank you guys for helping us better understand the machine. And I think there's definitely a common thread. I think there's two things that are common. Not only is the hardware mostly the same, but I believe the soul of what how it resonated in our lives. Because uh, for us Cocoa Nuts, we're going to say the color computer was our first love that we'll never forget. And in a lot of ways, it helped us become who we were going to be in our careers. And I think that is true very much for a lot of uh, dragon folk too, right? Is it, that's your first love that you're still, it's still endearing to you. And, and it, and either it, it helped you launch a career or in the case of Duncan, it was actually part of his career. But um, so it's great that we share not only the DNA in the hardware, but almost the DNA in our lives of what the things have done for us. And I'm so glad we could get everybody to assemble for this, you know? 
And we've learned the hard way to have at least two backup streamers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't yeah. need a backup restreaming service. That's what we need. Yeah, man, that's the next thing. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to say that I, I think that, you know, a lot of the people, you know, we were quite young back in the day. Um, we didn't realize how close the Coco and the Dragon were because most of the games we're playing, enjoying, like I said, I, you know, I love Lunar, Lunar Rover Patrol and Whirly Bird Run. I mean, all these games came out of the States. And um, even though we had our great homegrown stuff, you know, like you said, Chucky Egg, which is a great game, we, we, we owe a lot to the Coco as well. So, yeah, I absolutely agree in. with that. Yeah. yeah. I want to mention, too, you guys had some influence on us. Like, here's a, a color computer news if you want to spotlight me here. So, this is the. Uh, or just put them on speaker view or something. July 1983 issue of Color Computer News magazine. Uh, hang on. Zoom's being. Where? I hit spotlight yeah. and it didn't do anything. Is Curtis frozen or is it just. No, I'm. No, he's holding it still. It's just, oh, you know why? Because I'm sharing. Okay. For some silly reason, it breaks. Okay, now we're... Color so computer this, news. Was, this is what... This issue came out before Tano had announced that they were bringing the Dragon to the North American market. So this is an actual British Dragon 32. The uh, publisher of Color Computer News, Bill Sias, actually had bought ahead of time. And then he you know, did the little cute, you know, stuffed dragon and stuff here. You know, I, I stuck it on the bay or something like that. But uh, this was my first exposure that the Dragon even existed. Uh, and this was a couple months before it got released. Now, I, I will give you one plug. We've actually got the guy that did this magazine back in the day. And this was the very first Coco dedicated magazine. This came out several months before Rainbow did. So like in earlier 1981. And he's actually going to be our guest on September. I can't remember here now. September 4th. So I'm going to ask him about you know him getting this dragon back in the day. And also you know what happened to the magazine. Because it just abruptly stopped. But you guys had some influence on us too. I mean, this keyboard that you guys had was so much better than the Chiclet keyboard we had in the Coco 1. I don't know where Merck Data Products got their professional keyboard from, but it's basically similar to the Dragon. So that influenced us too, because then all of a sudden we were buying replacement keyboards to try to get it so it worked as good as the Dragon keyboard did. So you, you guys had cable. some influence on us this way too. Speaking of the keyboard, that, that almost looks like a Dragon 64 keyboard, unless I'm imagining it on that magazine cover. Um, it's a Dragon 32, so I think it's the 32 keyboard. Oh, uh... Oh no, it is, it is. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, one, one thing is fascinating, going back to the earlier part of the show when the, the Amigos were on, was there was this shared software that we got on both sides and some stuff originated, well, most of it, I think, originated on the North American market and then got resold through MicroDeal, wherever in the state or in on the UK and, and uh, Europe. And we had a few that kind of came back here but there was this unique software done on both sides that up until the internet really happened, I don't think any of us really knew that you guys had hundreds of games that we didn't have, and we had hundreds of games you didn't have. So all of a sudden, you know, in the last 20 years, our software libraries have been expanding without having to rewrite anything really, except maybe patching keyboard routines here and there, which has been just great. I mean, it's, 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 it's added, like we thought we had maybe had seven, 800 games for the Coco, you know, compared to some of the other bits, it's kind of low. Well, now you combine the two, there's 1200 to 1500 unique games at least. Which is unfortunately for my game's website means I have a hell of a lot more work to do. <laughs> I, I must have realized that the, the, about the Coco being so um, close because this is a, an issue of Microdeal News. It's at issue number two. And there's quite a few mentions of Coco games in there. about, And he's got a list of cartridge games that are known to work and, and so things like that. So I don't know. Um, I don't know whether that's actually archived anywhere. I, I must have, I got this in it's dated April of 1983. So it must have been very soon after I got the dragon. And it's just a two pages. So it's an early version of that magazine that was shown earlier. But uh, there's quite a few mentions of the Coco in there. It's where I must have picked it up from. But uh, yeah, I don't think it was a major thing in the magazine articles. I've scanned about 10 or 12 magazine articles over the, the last yeah. year. Looking well, I do know from talking to some of you people before we were doing the pre, you know, the calls on Zoom test calls, you guys had mentioned that Tandy in the UK did sell games yeah. meant for both. Yeah. And you would never have seen that up here. They didn't sell anything that didn't come from Radio Shack. They wouldn't even sell third party cooking stuff, never mind, you know, something for a different machine entirely. I'm sure there used to be adverts in Dragon News of a rainbow or hot cocoa. And I, and I sort of got that there was a computer out there that was similar. And there was a, there was a machine code program that did the conversion of the basic tokens as well. So you yeah. could. Converted, but it, it it didn't mean a lot to me. It was like well, it was just some other computer from somewhere else. 
I did. It, it, I didn't put two and two together until a lot later. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, the trick where you could save it in ASCII, and then you could just load it on each one without having to do any versions, but save slower. Same with the MC10. I mean, that was another thing we had to do here too. If you wanted to convert programs back and forth, you had to save those in ASCII. But yeah, they're 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 a lot closer than cousins. They're almost like step siblings or something. I guess. Mm-hmm. And I probably didn't realize that if I'd written it for the one, I would have got it for the other one for nothing for the American market. That's, that's how naive I was. <laughs> Yeah. Well, now you get more incentive to get the quill done, right? Because now you got two platforms to get it for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. <laughs> and that's when the big bucks roll in. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've got a confession, Tim. I've got a confession. When, when, when I was younger and I was at high school, I must have been 15 or 16 and you used to have the home computer club. And it was yeah. where you signed up for a year and you had to pay money each month. Me and my mate went, oh, well, really like this, but I'm, I'm not 18 yet and I don't really want to get uh, hooked up for it. So we signed each other's form and uh, we joined it. Knowing it was totally dodgy because we couldn't pay the money anyway, but I had a copy of the quill come. I'm really sorry. I, I, I confess, <laughs> and you know, fine, that's fine. Don't worry about it. So, uh, it's, uh, I think uh, <clears throat> I, I wouldn't like to see how many games and, and pieces of software amongst my millions here than of someone else's that I didn't pay for. I'm sure it was fairly, uh, but I, I genuinely, over the years, I, if I've used something commercially or extensively myself. I bought a copy and yeah. mm. we, we sold plenty. Don't worry. I mean, I found an article that said we sold 30,000 in 1984. So, you know, that's what's so cool now, though, knowing that, that back then it was something I really hankered after. And, and having met you at the Dragon Meetup, this is brilliant. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, thank you. So, so, so if, if any of us Yanks from the uh, across the pond could make it to Cambridge for a Dragon Meetup, would you welcome us? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I would love to uh, get yeah, anywhere, I would too. get anywhere outside of the United States at this point, but yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, you you guys would have uh, of course known the quill if it got it. You'd you'd actually it would have been called Adventure Writer, so which was done by a company called Code Writer Corporation out of um, Chicago. So uh, they licensed it in theory for North America, but I then, think uh, Stefan actually mentioned that when he was on for his yeah. his interview. Yeah, they. They, they did, but they, they actually, there was an advert for it in one of the British magazines, actually, for recently I found, but I didn't know. They'd started advertising in Britain as well in competition with us. <laughs> so I'd have to write Adventure Writer now, wouldn't I, for the Dragon and the Coco? So. Well, yeah. one of the things that I hope we, that we, we get from this is that for those of you who have been on, hopefully you'll be wanting to come on again in the future as either doing a, a proper interview or even just coming on to give us an update. Or something so we're hoping that we've made you guys feel warmly welcome to join us in the future for any reason whatsoever and then also possibly uh, maybe some people in the dragon community who were not necessarily interested in watching this show now that we've done a proper show for your platform they might want to consider watching us more in the future too because we do try to cover dragon stuff in our news segment as as we find it and i think the only thing that i feel uh, unfortunate about it is that we just don't understand it as much so we're doing our best to share facebook feeds and youtube videos but we don't have that kind of lineage and history and fuller understanding that you guys do so we're trying to do the best we can but it'd almost be great if we could get an interpreter so <laughs> somebody from the community that comes on and just corrects us or fills in some of the blanks and stuff like that so if you guys ever want to come on even on a semi-weekly basis to help us get the news facts you know more uh, fleshed out properly that would be great too yeah, yeah, but Steve, that would spoil my enjoyment. <laughs> it's like watching I, me try to play a game and not get off level one. No, no, right? no. So. I, I'm forever going, no, that's not right. No, no, that didn't buy that. No, no, no. And it's like, that's part of my enjoyment of listening to it, of just shouting at the screen. <laughs> well, I'm glad we serve a purpose. Yeah, my ignorance is for your amusement. <laughs> you don't need an interpreter. You just save it all as ASCII. And then we'll reload it as ASCII this time. <laughs> awesome awesome and thanks for our other regular panels for being here and uh, ron delvo who's still here and grant and mark b l curtis uh, who else am i missing no that's about it uh, uh rick rick Ulan's here rick so thanks guys uh any other questions we didn't get to or anything you guys want to say while we're still here or are we done enough like you know, say I'm very late what what's that my cats say dinner is very late. Oh, the cats are cats are complaining. <laughs> thanks to uh, thanks Mark B for picking up the slack. And um, sometime tomorrow, I'll have a complete 
uh, contiguous episode completely defragged. I'll run it through uh, Roberto's tool and see if there's any missing bits or blocks <laughs> yeah. in the uh, in the sine waves of data. And we'll get that all smoothed out. So yeah, the cassette version will be going out right after that. So. Yes. So do we want to press the button? I'll just say one thing uh, just to all the Dragon panelists here that, um, you know, we have a group email going, please contact me through that. And I'd like to book some of you guys on for interviews. If you guys want to do a group interview, like if it makes sense for a couple of you to be on the same time because you share projects, just let me know and we'll try to book it. I will say right now, we just got another tentative booking for September 18th. So I think we're on to the 20, what does that be? The 25th is now the first open slot. Uh, for interviews, because we've got interviews booked right through that that time period right now, but everything after that's open. So anytime after that date. Excellent. So we want do we want to say goodbye? Say goodbye, everybody. Put us on gallery view, Mark B, so we can get a group bye bye photo. Here. Here group, group gallery photo. view. Well, maybe the my computer's not showing me that because my nope, you're in speaker view. Mark B, you're still in speaker view. Um, that's not what I'm seeing on YouTube. Well, look at what you're seeing in Zoom. What do you see in Zoom right now? Uh, gallery. Okay. Well, then, are we in the gallery? Yeah, I see gallery on YouTube right now. Okay. I guess we can all do the group wave. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Bye everybody. everybody. Thank you. Thank you.